stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Hollywood Museum. We're in the historic Max Factor building on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. And our guests today are Amanda Pope, who's a director, and artist Ramsey Dow. Award-winning filmmaker, director, professor, Amanda Pope was born in Boston and raised in the countryside near New York City and Cape Cod. She's worked at the BBC for, and for the Eurasia Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, Amanda's a member of the Women in Film Foundation, the New York Women, and she was a juror for the National Endowment of the Humanities. She earned a BA at Wellesley, and what were you expecting to do with that, Amanda? Well, I wasn't going to become an academic. I knew that much. <laughs> that much, and there and, you are. And, and I didn't want to go into publishing, which is what all my classmates, which is what you were supposed to do. I thought it would be really a drag to work on writing other people's publicity blurbs. So I really didn't. I knew I wanted to live abroad after I left Wellesley. Oh, you did. So is that what you did right away? Yes, I was guaranteed working papers. It was an experiment for uh, at any place in, in England that would hire me. And one woman graduate from Cambridge was guaranteed working papers in the U.S. So I figured what was, so I went to work for the BBC as a secretary. As a secretary, but when you left Wellesley, did they say there was a place at the BBC, no, no, or did no, you no, just no. knew you were going to find a place? Is no, that... no, no. You have to. You have <laughs> to be adventuresome. You have to be open to possibility. And I've had a lot of really wonderful things happen. You weren't trained as a secretary, so. Oh no, that's not true. I went to summer school at Harvard to learn to do shorthand. I mean, we're talking 1960. Ex but that's great because you're taking a chance on doing something. You're coming out of Wells. Was it all girls then? All women? Oh yeah, it still is. Still, oh, it still is. They never... We had a lot of access to men, but they weren't in our classroom. <laughs> they were at Harvard, right? <laughs> So you t oh so you took a secretarial course, and and then I when I was hired by the BBC, um, I told my boss that I found shorthand was insulting and that that I would I would be happy to write any letters he wanted written and if he didn't like the way I did it I'd do it again, so I never I never had to use it. So you never used your never. secretarial skills? No, I wasn't. No, I was a secretary at the BBC for over. Over a year, I was working, I had seven African young men bosses. I was part of the Afri BBC oh, was, African Service. So what does that mean, part of the African well, Service? Well, at that time, they were, uh, uh, Britain was broadcasting out to the former colonies. And all these, mm. in the 60s, it was a great time to be in Africa because uh, the countries were just becoming uh, independent. independent. Ghana had become independent. I had given the then uh, president of, of Tanganyika, I had given him a tour of Wellesley when he had come to, to do a symposium. And I knew, I mean, he's an incredible Just quite man. by chance? And well, no, you were I the was BBC? interested in Africa. My, I had an older brother who uh, had worked with Albert Schweitzer, who was a very famous humanitarian doctor. I see. And so I, I was intrigued. Um, I was intrigued with Africa, and uh, it was it was terrific. I had my job was to sort of be the basically the go between between the African young men who are broad uh, who are learning to be broadcasters and the British public. That's what I was going to ask you. So they had African men in your at the BBC, and were they doing the broadcasting that was going to they the were, country? Yeah, they were broadcasting to East Africa, West Africa, in various languages, and, and I learned Swahili oh. at the time. Oh, what kind of shows were they doing? 
basically talk shows, uh, human oh, interest shows. Really? They would have come to the Hollywood Museum, definitely. I know. This would have been a real <laughs> oh, great they place. Would have, they would have loved so it. it wasn't just news broadcasts. They oh, no. were creating their own stories? It's, they, oh, they would write their own stories. And it was, it was really to create a good exchange between the former colonies and, and the Brits. And we also had, I also had two former colonial uh, officers who were also my bosses. So I basically had eight bosses. Did you go to Africa a lot? Yes. Then oh, I did. then at the time I I wanted I wanted to <coughs> work there. I've always believed that you can, you know, really there are three ways that you should travel. You should go to to work or make a film. You should go to visit <laughs> a friend, or you should go with a lover. Otherwise, there's three ways. Know. Well, what other ways are there? You've yeah. done the making the film one, right? I've done them all, <laughs> shall we say? Yeah. You've done them all. <laughs> yeah. No, when I um, I was I also was accepted with the first group of women who were accepted in the Peace Corps, but they they wanted to mm -hmm. send me to the Philippines, which I thought was totally absurd because I had I knew Africa, so I turned them oh, down and oh. decided I could do it myself. And then the BBC came along and Well then... I was working for the BBC. I told my mother in the States that I had a job <laughs> and which I didn't and um, then I wrote to the Ministry of Education in Tanzania and offered to, to teach. I'd never taught. Oh. And um, and the the gentleman the the broadcasters that I worked for said that you know well if you don't get a job um, at the uh, you know uh, in teaching you can come and we'll hire you so I I went to Africa I had no idea actually oh. I had no I hadn't heard from the Ministry of Education I had no idea I came oh. down on a I came down on a uh, Lloyd Triestino liner. And I had no idea actually where I was going to be spending the night. Um, I arrived in Dar es Salaam, and I also, by that time, I had gotten a letter saying that they were going to hire me to teach. Oh, but you didn't know that at no, the time. No, I didn't know that at the time. So it was, it was a lot. So I've had a lifetime of being open to adventure, and it has always come my way. But I think that was a lot of youth and a lot of guts <laughs> coming yeah, along it too, continues, right? It continues, <laughs> it continues. I just, I just did a film in China under very, for the USC Shoah Foundation, under very, very tight time frame. And, you know, it, it, it was terrific. I was working with our former students at the cinema school. They, uh, and I, I mean, all those, those relationships are part of what making uh, Work oh, I think I think the background, I think that backstory is very important in one's life. And talking about that, you also worked for the Eurasia Foundation, which has a connection to Europe, right? Oh, absolutely. They have a heavy-duty connection with the former Soviet Union, now the oh. uh, CIS. And I had a friend who was actually she was on the board, and she was. They were very interested once again in in doing, making it possible for people in the former, in the countries of the former Soviet Union um. to uh, be successful in the market economy. And as she was talking to me about this, because I used to go back and forth to Washington, I said, well, you really ought to do portraits on, on these people. And the next thing I knew, uh, Eurasia Foundation had asked me to go to seven countries of the former Soviet Union in five weeks, which is, you couldn't do it now because of the restrictions. Um, but so Eurasia opened the doors? Um, oh, absolutely. Those. They, that's and were they, there were portraits of what? Testimonials? Well, and life, life portraits. There was one woman who had opened a little, you know, a little dress shop. There was another mm. guy who had started a tile factory. I see. You of know, that work, work. Very, some, there was a journalist in Azerbaijan. There was, oh, there are these. You the, went to Armenia, too. I was Armenia. Azerbaijan, Georgia, mm. um, uh, Ukraine, um, uh, Russia. Oh, uh, so yeah. it was, it, and that was. So I mean, we were only in Azerbaijan for fourteen hours, just actually. to do your work, and and, and then we were into, see, into Armenia. See. So you weren't going to teach. But you ended up as a professor I, at USC. I know, but you know what I was teaching in Africa was secondary school. I'd never taught a day in my life, and I arrived at the school, and they were just at the point of um, moving from a colonial 
country oh, right. to a new, you know, independent country. So um, these these students had never had the. These were wonderful students. They were all from the, the mountain tribes that that bring you your coffee. Oh, how and, great! And um, they just were so enthusiastic about learning. So and you had to. Create a curriculum, actually. Totally created a <laughs> curriculum. Right. I looked, all the books that they had in the bookstore were simplified versions of Silas Morn, Marner, oh. David Copperfield. And I looked at these and I thought, how the devil are these going to relate to these young women? So I ordered up books from the, um, the, the young Nigerian authors. There was a Chenua Achebe and... They, uh, you know, so they could have a, an idea of uh, of what their people was more were contemporary, and, yeah. and from their own people. Um, I'm going to jump right into your other film because that's an, another kind of adventure for you. Is it was it Kazakhstan? Oh, you mean Desert of Forbidden Art? Yes. Nard. Well, that was directly as a result of the Eurasia Foundation. That's that's why I wanted to go and, from there to that. And it was a result when the Eurasia Foundation asked me to do this this five week trip, which I thought, oh my goodness, that's almost impossible. I thought I don't want to work with anybody my own age because what I can't stand is professionals who complain. <laughs> you know, life is just too short. So I thought I'll work with the, I'll work with some of my recent graduates oh. who will think it's a fabulous adventure. And that's exactly what happened. And during that filming, I worked with Chavdar Georgiev, with whom I then spent seven years making Desert of Forbidden Art. But where did he come from? What student? He was my student. He was my student at the cinema school. At the he, at USC. So he graduated from um, USC. He but he spoke fluent Russian. I see. I and see. then we were we went to Uzbekistan. We were uh, yeah, we were also in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Um, but when we were in Uzbekistan, we learned of this collection. So, of Mr. Art. Sinsky, tell us about that. Uh, uh, Sin Sinetsky? Savitsky, you mean the, the collection? He's, it's hard with the names. What His is name it? was Igor Savitsky. Savitsky. And okay. he was a very charming, eccentric man who began collecting folk art in Uzbekistan and had sort of self, you know, he'd self-retired. He self-isolated himself from the Moscow art scene because a very famous Moscow artist told him he was no good. And as was an he a artist, painter? he was a painter. Oh, I see. He was and a painter. he almost committed suicide, as we were told. But instead, he figured he'd come back to the desert. He, when he had been a younger man, he'd been part of an archaeological expedition, oh. which was a very famous archaeological expedition. That, um, and he loved the desert, so he figured he'd come back to the desert. Then he started collecting this folk art. And but did he just collect it in that vicinity, yes, or did he? Yes, you know, just in just in that vicinity, and it was a very precious time to do it. It was in the seventies because, um, you know, it was it was in the seventies because he died in the eighties and uh, late sixties, seventies, and that was nobody. You know, the, the Soviets were there; they were trying to get everyone to wear tunics. And they you know, didn't and like they, art. That oh, was no, they were totally not into folk art, right. and they didn't want to encourage anything that established a people's cultural identity. They wanted, you know, everyone to assimilate and consider oh, just themselves to be... a Soviet citizen. I see. So that if I in see. any way you had your own jewelry or your own, you know. Weaving that that needed to be de-emphasized. Oh, that's very interesting. That yeah. they didn't like folk art from all the regions. Oh, totally they not. didn't work. Th that would have brought them all together. Yeah, no, but they, they wanted didn't want you that. to just you know think about the Soviet ideal and and but there were people. I mean, we where we filmed in Uzbekistan, um, it was a small part, a small country within Uzbekistan, and these people did not, they were still very proud. And um, so when you have this somewhat eccentric guy from Russia 
collecting your grandmother's you know, so old he's clothes. buying from he's, these people who are there yeah he's buying the stuff he's collecting it and they think they consider it junk because they have been right. brought you know, up with basically it. brainwashed to say it was junk. oh they've been brainwashed to but say it's junk, junk. Yeah, not because they've been brought up with it and they're used to no, it a they, different kind they, of they valued it but see, um they they put it in their chat you know they sort of hid it away and, i see and, I see. and then when they saw he was interested they let him buy it from So them. you made this film, which was an award winner, yeah. Desert of Forbidden Art. Right. Um, That's the one you saw at the Beverly Hills Public Library. I did. And you had Ben Kingsley. Got and you ben had Kingsley Sally Field. Field. And Ed Asner. Ed Asner. How did you get those people to come into your... Um, well, sometimes you just... I mean, I don't have power. <laughs> and I don't have a lot of money, but I have a certain amount of respect from the films that I've done. And um, the community, the acting community here is very, very generous. And if you can get to them and tell them what you're doing, um, very often they will voice right. it for you. And Ben Kingsley and also ben was Kingsley, the voice of? He was the voice of Igor Savitsky. He was the boy, voice of the collector. And Ed Asner? And he was the voice of an artist in a uh, critical trial. I'm so glad you came and talked to us today, <laughs> Amanda Pope. Go out and see her film. It's great. And we'll be right back with artist Ramsey Dow. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We are at the Hollywood Museum, and our guest is artist Ramsey Dow, who was born and raised in Los Angeles, graduated from UC Davis, and he got a BA in poli sci. Ramsey was the artistic director of Anthem Magazine, and he shows his work at the KM Fine Art on La Cienega, uh, Boulevard, and as your dealer said, cool Echo Park artist. <laughs> so, is that the spot, Echo Park? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a nice neighborhood. Are um, there a lot of artists there? Uh, there are. I mean, all over Los Angeles. I've got a lot of friends that, 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 are, um, that are practicing artists. It's a very vibrant scene. So, did you, taking art at Davis, UC Davis, you had a great art uh, program well i didn't i didn't study art so um the, actually the first art history class i took was at uh, ucla extension a few years ago because you had i think you had wayne tebow and robert arneson and all those uh san francisco artists were teaching at uc davis i i, I you know i grew up the son of a lawyer and um <laughs> and my, you didn't know about artists <laughs> well i just i i my mom was a painter. Oh, and she I did, was? Yeah, and uh, she graduated from uh, Berkeley. She has her master's from Berkeley. They had great teachers there, too, yeah, right? Yeah, and uh, I, I just didn't, I, I was, you know, on the business route, I thought, and um. by the time I was graduating from college, I did not want to go to further school, and I wanted to do graphic design, and you know, work for skateboard and snowboard companies. Oh, and stuff like that. <laughs> were you on the skateboard all the yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. I still get on it, actually. And were you on, oh, you're so tall. How tall are you? 6'3". Uh, 6'3". Six, three. Six, three. And do you have an extra large skateboard, no, or are you no, just a regular, regular size? size. <laughs> so you took political science. What were you planning to do? Uh, I didn't really know. It, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I figured maybe I would go to law school or grad school. Um, I'd figure it out hmm. later, you know, uh -huh. it was... I was kind of just on that path, that uh, academic path of you know doing well in school, and you'd figure it out later, you know. I think a lot of us did that, right? And yeah. whatever fell in our lap. Well, did the magazine fall in your lap? Uh, well, actually, that I, I wasn't the art director there, but I was friends with the publisher, and oh. so I would help out on projects, and I, I would see. interview artists and oh, uh, you would. DJs or musicians that I was interested in. And I did that. Uh, I had a graphic design company, uh, advertising agency that but I had run for 20 years. The, the graphic arts, you did run that? Yeah, yeah, I did that for uh, 20 years. I mean, and then I still who did you do? What were you doing? Who were you working for? Uh, it was a lot of companies in the action sports market. So companies like Vans Shoes and um, Sanuk Sandals and um, Dita Eyewear, which is a sunglass company. Um, done stuff with uh, Specialized Bicycles, which is the largest 
bicycle manufacturer so, in the world. So what did you do? Their advertising campaigns? I or? would do advertising campaigns. I would design logos, you know, identities for companies. But how did you know how to design? I, it's just innate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because you, um, with, with um, Anthem, did you, and you were doing the interviews, did you have a chance to ch choose the graphics that you wanted or the typeface that you wanted? Uh, not really. You so know, you weren't had, even involved at that point? Yeah, well, we were just good friends, you know, and um, I think, you know, he was busy running the magazine and I was busy running design. Oh, you, you were know, running design your design then, so. I see. So you I was didn't painting help at the same time as well. Oh, you were? Yeah. But how did you know what to paint and how to paint? Well, I just experimented <laughs> a lot, you know? I see, I see. So, so... Um, the art was developing along the way while you were actually had a job, yeah. a full-time <laughs> graphic job, which you loved. So um, how did you choose materials, or how did you decide what kind of art you were going to do? Well, um, I did a lot of experimenting, and I think like all artists, you, you mimic artists that you like. Okay, that's a know, good point. And, and who were you mimicking? Um, I definitely was influenced by... I really like the Warhol Basquiat collaborative works uh, that kind of combine the um, pop art with, you know, the the um, abstract mark making and that kind of thing. Um, oh, because the marking, you like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the covering up, you know, right, or like right. uh, Rauschenberg's Erase de Kooning, I thought was just such a powerful idea right, to right. to destroy an artwork and thus create a new artwork you know right. Ai Weiwei does that when you know the Ai Weiwei the... does it too yeah exactly yeah. breaking all those pots yeah, yeah. how could he do that it's yeah. like scary right yeah. so how would you describe your work then well it it's gone through a lot of variations and and I think around 2012 was when I started trying to trying to flip my practice where I'm spending more time painting and uh, less time doing commercial uh, work. I see. And coming out of that, I was simplifying my work, and I, I kind of started turning towards collecting images, you know, as you do with graphic design. You're, you're kind of taking fonts and images and putting them together. So I started doing that, and I, I found, you know, the collage technique that the Dadas invented. And, oh, the collage, yes. So yeah. I, that's what I was thinking your work was, but, but they're with appropriated images. Yeah. So this is like the cover of this mm -hmm. catalog. Is this from the KM? Yeah, it's from the current show at KM, yeah. And then this is a really beautiful page. Tell us tell us what this is. Yeah, so that, um, my process is I, I try to keep it uh, unguided when I'm collecting material, just paying attention to what I'm interested in and what grabs my attention. And then the collaging process, I actually make the collage is you know analog it's a real real cut paper and whatnot it really is so i was going to ask you what materials do you use scissors yeah scissors exacto <laughs> knives razor blades Gl you know. glue uh some glue not a lot i liked i like having the paper um curl oh. up and having the cast shadows so i oh, photograph really the work and oh. i'll move the light around to get the the shadows how I want them and it, oh. that really adds to the dimensionality oh, of the work. Oh, 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 here I like this. Yeah. This shows maybe more because it has the typeface. Yes. And it looks more dada. Yeah. It looks very surreal. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this. Well, um, it's again I, I found this orange advertisement and I think it was a J. Crew catalog and it was this fluorescent orange and it was just a beautiful color and I had this I think um, the blue came from might have been a LACMA catalog or something. Oh, really? Like that. So, so you have a whole yeah, uh, I, I cl you know like you I have said, a whole I, background of things. You have some yes, a lot I of material, I right? A lot of print material mostly, and oh. um, I tear them out of books and magazines when I read them, and, mm. and I save them. I'm gonna find something else in here. This too is very much the same color. Yeah, is well, this those the same? are those are the actual. Uh, studies that I made. So those are the, the actual paper collages that I made um, and then photographed and then made the paintings, the photorealistic paintings, which are six foot tall. They're six feet? Mm -hmm. So so this is the first process that I'm showing right now. Yes. And then the last process was would be the, actual, the other... The painting. The painting. Very like time consuming, the, uh, you know, high attention to detail. I see. And then are they framed? What are they on? What's the background? They're on wood panel. Wood, so they're heavy. Yes, very heavy. 
So, so where does all the inspiration come from? Um, I guess just kind of my my subconscious, my daily life, my you know readings. I read a lot of um, like mm. neuropsychology and I know what, philosophy and what stuff do you like read that. about what. Well, I'm, what I'm, reading, do you read? I'm reading a couple of books on artificial intelligence right now, which is really kind of scary when you think about where we're headed with computer technology basically being able to emulate humans. And when they get to a level of, of a certain level of intelligence, they'll be able to build themselves better and surpass us. Just like all the movies, you know, the science fiction movies we see. And, but we might need that technology in order to get through our problems that we have, you know? So when you're in the studio, you're thinking about those things, those come in the background? Is this well, kind of like something like that? That is a, a sculptural piece. That was my first sculpture, um, and it's plate steel, and it's... Oh, it is. Again, it's, it's from a cut paper collage um, that I had made a large painting of, and then I decided to explore three dimensions with that and take it back into a... A dimensional space, so that's actually layered pieces of steel. And how'd you get the steel? Did you cut it yourself? Uh, I or did you have not. Some... I, no, because I, it's heavy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I did get. I got it cut with. Uh, had a CNC machine that traced my original uh, uh -huh. paper shapes to uh -huh. get the exact hand cut shapes made, and um, then I worked with a, a sculptor to do the the firing and and. Um, the forging to bend the shapes and to weld oh, them all together. So oh, they have the oh, slight curves of, oh, you know, when you cut paper out and let it sit out. It that's what that, you like when they yeah, curve like that? Mm -hmm. How tall is this piece? It's 40 inches. So it's kind of pretty tall. Yeah, it's, it's not a size. table piece, right? Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it would need to sit on a plinth or something. It needs to sit on good, something else. Yeah. Um, you were talking about your inspiration and reading about this artificial intelligence and all that. But... You've also talked about an internal compass mm -hmm. that kind of guides you. What is that about? Well, I think, um, you know, I've, I've actually read a lot of similar ideas from many of the artists that I like, where they say when they know it's done, it's done. Oh, oh right. You know, or... That's your internal compass? Yeah. It's telling you something? Yes. And it's, you know, you, you, I like to try, you know, some of these um, uh, automatistic techniques like, you know, abstract collage you're just moving stuff around and then it clicks you know it looks good or or these two colors look nice together and it's not a plan you're not using some like color theory to decide oh, but you oh, well, look your own your own inner exactly. inner self tells you what's going on yeah so your show at km do you build a body of work a specific body of work or is this a yes. lot of your old things it's no it's all specific for the for the show so, and what is the theme? What would the theme be? Well, it's kind of just what I, whatever I'm interested in at that at that time, you know. And but it's a whole th it's a it's, whole group about what you're interested in. It's it's a it's a group of, you know, the 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 subject matter and the the style and maybe the colors kind of all intersect uh, as as oh, a body, I you I know. See. And whatever I can get, this was ten months in the making, so oh, it whatever was. I can get done in that time is what's going to be. In the show, and how many pieces do you show? Uh, there are ten paintings, the one uh, sculpture, and there are, I believe, seven collages that were the source material for the paintings. I love the way you use the the graphics. I think this is a great. This is a study, right? Yes, those are both studies. Very, very nice for the sculpture. Uh, those are actually just paintings. Those were not the sculptures. They. But were, did they influence your sculpture? They look well, like the same. Well, it's the same technique, yes. It's the, you know, cutting out these kind of abstract shapes, you know, stone shapes or leaves or trying to make circles but not wanting them to be perfect. You just cut them out quickly and you get these kind of beautiful handmade shapes. And then putting them together, you know, abstractly, they form these kind of like tree shapes or... Mm. or uh, cactus shapes or something like the, that. The way you're, you're thinking. You talked about, you just mentioned stone. Have you worked in stone? I have not. No, no but that's going to be your next thing. <laughs> you just brought it up. That is the internal compass speaking. Thank you so much, Ramsey Dow. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. And we'll see you next time from the Hollywood Museum.